So Gloria has graciously agreed to um, uh, moderate this panel that'll be finding balance in dialogue, artists and art writer relationships. Mm -hmm. Gloria Bell, doctor, she has a PhD, she's Métis, and she's an hist art historian and a Chair of Foundation Rome Prize Fellow working at the McGill University. Bell's research interests include Inuit, Métis, and First Nations art, exhibition histories, sashes, beadwork, creative writing, global histories of indigenous tattooing and body art, and histories of photography. And if you look at our website, you can subscribe to their newsletter. So thank you, and please take it away. Hey, thank you so much, America. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Haudenosaunee in Montreal. And again, I'd just like to thank America and First American Art for this um, really inspiring discussion and also for this opportunity and to thank all the amazing panelists that we've had today. Man, I'd also just like to shake my rattle here. Okay, all right. Um, just a quick reminder that you can put your questions in the Q&A and we'll do our best to answer your questions um, towards the end of this discussion. So there'll be about, I think about 15 minutes or so for discussion and for your questions. All right, so now I'll move into talking about our wonderful panelists. Okay, so Melissa Malero Moose is Northern Paiute and Modoc and is a mixed media artist, curator, and founder of the Great Basin Native Artists. Based in Nevada, Malero Moose has a BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts and a BS degree from Portland State University in Oregon. Currently, she is creating an archive and directory of Great Basin Artists for the GBNA at the Nevada Museum of Art. Nanette Kelly is from the Osage Nation and Cherokee Nation and is the 2021 California Arts Council Administrators of Color Fellow for the Greater Northern Region of Upstate California. A professional writer and artist based in California and Oklahoma, she is obtaining her master's degree in Indigenous Education and Policy with an art and traditional ecological knowledge curriculum emphasis from Arizona State University. Michelle J. Lynn Terry is a curator, writer, and Mellon Predoctoral Fellow in Native American Art History at the University of Oklahoma, where she teaches courses in global arts and has contributed research to the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art Collections. Lynn Terry earned an MA in Art History at New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, where she worked on curatorial collaborations for the Campus Gallery and Museum. And please join me in welcoming our wonderful panelists. Yay. Okay. So our first question is, can you talk about your processes of working with artists on producing articles? Thank you so much, Gloria and America and Nancy um, and Heather, just really inspiring day already. Um, and, you know, I also want to honor the Wichita and affiliated tribes um, here in central Oklahoma. Um, also the Caddo peoples um, and just, you know, honor the tribes past, present and future um, that steward these lands and care for these lands. Um, and in terms of process, getting to the question, um, you know, I've really grown to love uh, the direct interview with artists. There's really nothing like it um, just in terms of having um, that conversation live, you know, expect the unexpected. Um, you just never know what's going to come out of it. And often I find, you know, I prepare questions and I email them to the artist in advance. A lot of times I abandon the questions, you know, once I'm in the moment. So kind of like recognizing the flow is such an important facet I feel for my practice and honoring that because sometimes you might get a response that there's no question you could have written that the artist is willing to share some aspect of the topic at hand. So I would encourage people um, to seek out interviews with people that you'd like to collaborate with and learn more about. And also to um, not be afraid to go off the rails and move away from your set questions. I agree completely. Um, I, I think I get started with that initial conversation um, to get things going. And then, um, and then I agree. Yeah, I mean, I have a set of questions, and I don't think I've ever followed them. Um, 
uh, they they get tossed out the window immediately because you are trying to just I mean you don't know where the conversation is going and at least um, I I uh, I definitely um, appreciate the the com the ways the conversation, um, uh, the twists and turns that happen when you're just having a visit, you know, a conversation. I'm right there with both of you. Um, I am somehow sometimes um, asked, "Well, where where are your questions? Why are you not asking me direct questions?" <laughs> And um, it's interesting because that usually comes from more of the non-native community than the native community. The native community um, ordinarily has a little bit different way of, of, of speaking. Um, but um, I love the in-depth conversation because when you're actually just getting to know somebody and not just hurling questions at them, it's more relaxed and you're getting a, actually a more truthful interview. Um, and personally, I look at it more as because I started out um, as an artist, I did not start out as a writer. And so I look at it as I'm an artist talking to another artist. So I usually just get lost in the conversation and then have to have to bring it back and, and realize, oh, that's right, I have to, <laughs> I do have to write this up. Um, but that's, that's um, how I start. And so yes, it, the questions are usually thrown out the window. I agree. Do you think that um, things have changed for you as artists, um, as curators, like over the years and, and what, what has changed or have things sort of stayed the same in your approach? Um, for me, I make myself more vulnerable now than I used to. Um, I think when I first started working with artists and speaking with people for articles or for curatorial projects that I would have this instinct to kind of protect you know, some things about me and where I was coming from sort of in this aspiration for, uh, you know, some semblance of professionalism as I understood it, you know, in, in that moment early on. And I feel like now and in the past couple of years, so much has changed um, just in terms of building those relationships and, um, you know, active listening as a big, big part of that, um, you know, respect throughout. Um, and, you know, just really keeping that dialogue going, you know, when, when I'm working on projects like writing and curatorial, but then also those in-between moments, I think are just as important, just those hello texts, or if somebody, you know, receives an important award or, you know, any sort of recognition to drop a line and, you know, congratulations. Uh, so I feel like those in-between moments are, are just as important as uh, the interviews and, you know, other processes that are project oriented. Yeah, I agree. And uh, definitely the things that have changed um, this year in particular is technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, ideally you would want to, um, at least for me, interviewing uh, Great Basin artists in uh, no Northern Nevada area, um, you know, I'm going to go to their house as long as it's within, you know, six to eight hours. I, if I can make it, I'm going to go and do an in-person visit. Then there's telephone, you know, um, if you, if time's not permitting and stuff. And, but now, I mean, you know, with Zoom and um, uh, email and, and things like that, you can, um, you know, send uh, your questions um, and um, sort of give them a heads up to, you know, the direction that you're going to go. Um, but that also is another form of keeping those relationships going. Um, one thing that I've noticed as an artist and a writer is going to, um, uh, like kind of dropping in on a, a conference on a, um, whether it be um, NASA out in uh, Tulsa, which was such a memorable experience a couple years ago. Um, and, um, and then ATOM uh, last year uh, in California. I mean, it was a really great time, but you got to see um, and interact with the people that, you know, you are um, forming those relationships with. So I guess you know, involving yourself in that community, it does help for better writing, it helps for better relationships. And it's something that, you know, we didn't exactly have um, years, many, many years ago, you know. What is ATOM? Can you tell me, tell us a bit more about that? I've never heard that acronym before. Does anybody know the acronym, uh, Archive and Tribal uh, Museum Conference, Tribal Archives? What about you, Nanette? Do you think like your process 
has sort of changed over the years or shifted or? Um, this, most recently, uh, it's it's shifted dramatically for the same reason, you know, uh, everyone else has shifted into a, a technology. Um, I am more of an in-person person and, um, but uh, as much as that has hindered me, um, reaching out to people locally because um, it's been very difficult to find people uh, during the pandemic. It's been very difficult um, getting in touch with some people through certain avenues because so many tribal offices have been closed on and off. And so um, networking has to kind of go around in circles sometimes. But um, on the flip side, it's really opened up uh, a lot of uh, doors into places I would probably never end up going. Uh, you know, just the Zoom conferences alone. Oh, well, let's go to the NAGPRA conference. I've never been to the NAGPRA conference, but I can go now because, hey, it's, um, it's online and I can participate in that way. And so um, uh, in a lot of ways, and I hate to say this, but it, the pandemic has actually connected uh, a lot of us that weren't necessarily connected before. And so, um, so I would say that would be the most major um, change that I've had to experience, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've certainly appreciated like listening in on a lot of different conferences that I wouldn't have access to before. But just the relationships that that opens up, you know, and the, it, it just, it really has helped. Um. Mm -hmm. So speaking about relationships, um, do you think your relationships with artists as like artists, writers, artists, curators has developed through, through your process and through your journey as a writer or how do you see that? Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of possibilities uh, for collaboration across platforms. Um, and, you know, like we're talking about right now, you know, just with this moment that there's so much potential for digital virtual mm -hmm. collaborations. Yeah. And so we've got this really cool opportunity to bridge these spaces and, you know, have these kinds of conversations that maybe you know, weren't as um, easy to do prior to this moment, maybe just because, um, you know, a lot of us in the field were, you know, figuring out how this technology works. You know, I can say that I, I didn't use Zoom, uh, you know, up until about a year ago. So, um, you know, it's just kind of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, so now Zoom is this, you know, um, you know, it's like Kleenex, right? It's just like, you know, this connection, um, yeah, are we Zooming? And <laughs> you use it and you throw it away. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and I have to say too that I've also had the experience of like merging tech, which I think is funny, but also kind of that expect the unexpected, um, mm -hmm. you know, like setting a cell phone with audio going in front of the speaker on my laptop while Zoom is recording, you know, and you just have to make it work and you're laughing and you're just like, we're going to do this and we're going to have fun. And, uh, you know, I promise it's not going to be, you know, forever and ever, you know, we'll, we'll, an hour, an hour and a half, but you just got to make it, you just got to make it work. <laughs> yeah, I think um, uh, a lot of the um, relationships, both again, as an artist and a writer have, have, um, uh, really evolved and um, stayed, you know, um, from a lot of the um, writing interaction that I've been doing. But I mean, I, I do both. So I mean, it's, it's hard to separate them because I'm, I'm constantly doing both equally. Um, but uh, with my group uh, out here, the Great Basin Native Artists, um, you know, I'm, uh, I've written letter or um, articles you know, for First American Art Magazine to cover um, that, you know, underrepresented region. Um, but also, um, I've maintained those relationships um, as an artist and as a curator and as a writer because um, it, it's just an amazing, um, you know, treasure to uh, uh, of resources to have all of these people in my life to constantly input, you know. Um, uh, what it is that I'm doing um, as those three um, hats that I wear. Um, but I, I'm, I'm appreciative of that. One thing I do have to say about, um, I guess, uh, a lot of non-native um, 
people writing about me as an artist, I haven't stayed in touch too much. They haven't either. I mean, one thing that I always end with is, can you send me the article or can you send me pictures, you know, from the photographer? And it's um, O for O <laughs> every single time I've ever asked. Um, uh, I've never had any uh, um, uh, continuing um, interaction. And that's something that I really would like, you know. I, I really appreciate that continuing interaction. Um, there are um, there are friends that I that I made through this process, and um, in some cases, I have um, ended up uh, assisting um, those those people with um, different things within their communities. And um, uh, land restoration is something that I'm very passionate about because if you don't have land, you know, you don't have the arts. We need our lands to perpetuate all that. And um, so I find some of these relationships actually um, working into community involvement uh, if I'm nearby, if, if it's where I happen to be um, at the time. So I do, um, I do appreciate that as well, being invited into those communities and um, you know, accepted to work alongside them in some way. I just wanted to jump in too, uh, to both of your points um, that, you know, uh, we, you know, with Melissa, with what you're saying, I think there's really an opportunity as arts writers to, um, you know, think of ways to keep the conversation going with the people that you're working with, the people that you've interviewed for articles and requested images from, you know, I just feel like there's this opportunity to continue the conversation. Um, and one way to do that um, you know, in my practice is to send copies of the magazine out. Um, you know, America is so generous with um, access to the new issues. And so if you've, you know, contacted a couple of museums for images, if, you know, you, you held an interview with an artist, and, you know, even if you didn't hold an interview with an artist, I would say if, you know, you write about someone, it's, it's a nice thing, you know, to return the gesture of their work um, by sending out a copy um, of the magazine. Um, and then just the other thing was that, um, you know, First American Art Magazine, I really love the process of editing uh, with the artists that we work with. And, you know, that there's such a back and forth and, you know, especially for the artist profiles that that can be like a month long process um, that the artist is involved in, um, you know, in terms of, of what's, uh, you know, put out into the world and in their words, particularly. I do that as well if, if I find the artist doesn't have access or don't have a subscription to the magazine. And that's, that's, very, uh, that's very nice of her to, to send those out and I'll, okay, what's your address? Um, thank you so much for the photographs. You know, here, here's the magazine, so yes. I, I actually um, started sending, uh, sending the articles out to, um, or, or even, you know, make sure that they have access to the magazine, um, just from the idea of they might be just a really busy artist, you know, and they might have completely forgotten about, maybe they're a rock star, you know, they might have forgotten that we did an amazing article on them. So um, it's just a, um, you know, a regular practice to make sure that they uh, saw them, you know, saw themselves in that magazine and that they um, promoted it too, because that promotes the magazine as well as themselves. <laughs> yeah, I love that idea of the gift subscription. I'm, I'm taking a note of that. I think that's, yeah, that's such a nice, nice gesture. Um, so what takeaways have emerged from your processes that, that shape your practices today, sort of your working relationships? I think accountability is the biggest one for me. Um, and, you know, it came up in a discussion just before this panel, um, Stacey Pratt mentioned, you know, the archive in terms of everything that's written and published, you know, digitally or in print and, you know, with First American Art, it's both, but that that's, there's a permanence to that. Um, and so just to, you know, consider what's going out there so seriously and, and in collaboration, uh, you know, with the editors and also, of course, you know, with the people that you're writing about or the, you know, exhibition and artworks or books, you know, that you're writing about. Um, so just to be conscious of that, you know, it, it contributes to a conversation 
that's fueling conversations for future generations. And so that archive is constantly building. Yeah. I, I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, I think um, for me, uh, a lot of, when I first started the, the writing processes and um, I guess before First American Art Magazine, I was, you know, I would contribute to some very small things here and there. Um, but um, as far as actual uh, artist um, profiles and uh, reviews, um, my writing experience was few and far between. So it was really great to um, get started with my writing um, and almost be forced to write with the magazine. So it's been a great opportunity. Um, but uh, I, my, I think my takeaway is, I mean, every single time I have that interaction, um, whether it be artist to artist or um, uh, dealing with uh, going to an exhibit and doing a review on a piece, you know, um, I, I learned so much as an artist, as a curator and as a writer to um, apply all of that, everything that I learned from the interactions of, you know, different people to my practices. Um, and as a uh, emerging artists back in the day, I was um, very ignorant of so many different things. And, um, you know, it really, really helped me grow um, in all of those directions. So I'm appreciative of, of being a forced writer, I always call it, but not anymore. <laughs> Is that that accidental writer thing again? Is that? <laughs> Is that yeah. What, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, um, I've found that in um, speaking to people all these years and um, there's a common theme. It, it seems that everyone is um, out for uh, the survival of their culture. And so it doesn't matter if it's, um, you know, um, basket making, um, more ancestral patterns, or if it's um, somebody that's using more Western style media, um, the iconography is usually somehow rolled into those pieces of art. And um, I, it just seems like uh, my, my takeaway from everything is we, most of us at least, seem to be in it for the same reason. We're actually trying to um, sustain our, our cultures. Um, there are some exceptions out there, but um, in general, we're, we're trying to um, preserve and sustain our cultures through the arts and um, and um, it's for me it's it's a, a, a privilege to document that um, personally. Um, yeah, I'm curious actually more um, Melissa, if you could talk a little bit about the archive project that you've been working on and I think and I think Nanette, you're just kind of hinting at it there with with the documentation and the sort of personal libraries and things like that. Um, yeah, I um the so the the project is is called the great basin native artist archive project and it did uh it came about through um working on and off with the nevada museum of art in reno nevada um and uh, uh i think they had a group show i think our first you know interactions were it's a group show in 2012 and called the way we live and um all of these artists were um uh, that I hadn't heard of before and that I knew were in this show. And um, afterwards I was like, can you send me that, um, that artist list and their contact info? Because I, I'm constantly, you know, if I, I wanted to put a show together or even just interact with these artists, it's like I have to refine them every single time. And this was, you know, right um, on the, the edge of, you know, um, uh, artists having emails, you know, before you had to write, sit down and write them a letter and uh, mail it off and hope that you would hear back from them eventually. But, but it, now it's, it's way better and, and people are, are Googleable. There's plenty that aren't, but um, that, that uh, I just needed um, funding that the, um, that the museum uh, granted me a research fellow fellowship to um, just sit down and, and get this list together and um, sort of create an archive on each artist, you know, as much as I possibly can. And I mean, it, it really is still after two years, um, uh, a, a little kind of like a, a skeleton archive, you know, where some, some of them I just have a name and where they're from 
and I'm, you know, if, if I find a bio on them, that's like a treasure hunting, you know, um, but, and then there's plenty of other artists that um, I have full um, large uh, archives on that. Um, it's just, it's just treasure in that place that um, I'm able to store it somewhere and access it on a regular basis for me as a, an artist wanting to reach out and interact and me as a curator and writer wanting to interact with these artists. It's been in, invaluable. So uh, here, here comes a kind of uh, funny question for us art historians, Michelle. So um, where do anthropologists and art historians fit, fit into this relationship with the artist writer? Do we, do we not? Um, what do you think about it? Um, yeah, no, this question made me smile when I, when I read it. Um, I'm still smiling. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the practice of arts writing and interviewing is about interdisciplinary work. And so, you know, speaking from personal experience, you know, I've found working in art history to be a place of interdisciplinarity. That's just how it's played out for me, but I think it's different from everyone. I think that one of the keys can be like figuring out where you as an arts writer need to be centered in order to you know, make those connections, build those relationships. Like, where do you feel comfortable um, in your practice? Um, but also to, you know, consider that the writing and the interviews um, and, you know, publications like First American Art, that these are changing these discourses in all kinds of fields, you know, as, as we continue on. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, whatever discipline you're coming from in terms of arts writing, um, I think, you know, it's a lot about connecting, it's a lot about accuracy and patience um, and excitement, um, and then also dedication um, to doing the work. Melissa or Nanette, what do you think about anthropologists and art historians working <laughs> in the field? Well, um, I um, don't often speak with them. I speak with them if necessary. Uh, I like to tell uh, enable someone else to tell their story um, as opposed to um, someone else's opinion of someone else's story, <laughs> um, which often happens if you talk to an art historian and don't talk to the artist, uh, if the artist is available. And so um, um, I've had really good experiences with anthropologists and uh, I have some that I absolutely am delighted to speak to um, and I don't see them enough. And then um, there are some that have not been so um, cordial um, that have stood up as the uh, claimed tribal representative anthropologist and um, uh, get disgruntled when you say, okay, well, thank you for telling me all this. Now I'm going to go to the tribe. Well, why do you have to go there? And so I've, I've found this to be perplexing because um, uh, a lot of my writing the past year uh, has been about the state of California. And so um, California is unique in, in that um, there are many people out here who are not what they appear to be. Um, uh, more so than uh, other places. So um, I'm very careful and I'm I, like uh, America was talking about, you know, museums vetting artists. I'm all for vetting the anthropologists and the art historians is my perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, my uh, initial work as a writer was for um, the media and newspapers as I was an artist writing historical and, and art features. And so I have that sort of reporter brain that, oh, I've got to vet this guy, you know, and that's what I came out of into writing for um, First American Art Magazine. So um, that's, that's my take on that. And like I said, I have some that I absolutely adore, but I'm skeptical when I, when I do first meet them um, to make sure they are who they say they are. Um, I think it's always good to be, yeah, really critical of like who's approaching you and to do your due diligence um, there's an interesting question from the audience, actually. Can you talk about some of your highest highs or lowest lows as an artist, writer, and in, in collaborating, if you want to share a story or anecdote? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely would. Um, so like most recently, I think something that really brightened up my week was um, hearing from a museum contact uh, who I had uh, reached out to about images. And I love the phrasing that that person wrote with and that person said, you know, thank you for you know, breathing life into this exhibition, continue this, continuing this exhibition's breath, you know, and I just was like, yeah, so like, you know, this seeing the layers and connecting the layers, um, you know, so that that's been one uh, really nice high point. Um, and I'd say, you know, another one is if an, if an artist posts, um, you know, an article that, you know, I collaborated on with them, like that makes me so happy, you know, if they're happy about it, that's really, just such a big deal uh, to me, you know, when the artists are happy about, you know, what's been printed and they, they, you know, put that out there on their social media feeds. I think, um, can only think of my highs. I'll try and think of a low because those are learning, learning moments. But um, my, I think my best story is one of my first um, uh, uh, artist profiles I did was with Ben Alec, uh, Pyramid Lake Paiute illustrator. And um, I mean, from that conversation and from working on his article, it literally birthed Great Basin Native artists. And you know, our conversation as two artists talking to each other and getting his article written, which was one probably one of the first um, really in-depth um, articles written on about him and his work. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, that uh, basically turned into us discussing, well, hey, you know, let's not just get together once in a while, let's, let's get together all the time. And let's make sure that, you know, we um, invite as many people as possible. And it, it turned it, it's morphed over the years, this group from a group to a uh, organization to a collective. Um, and now uh, I feel like it's morphed into the archive which, you know, mm. has turned into um, about a thousand entries um, and, and rising. And, um, and I also forgot to mention, I, I was invited this summer to um, IAI um, for a research fellowship where I was going over their archive and collection for the um, uh, Great Basin artists that they've had from um, uh, then to, to from past present. And, um, you know, I mean, that really added to my collection. And it also, I mean, just, just like all of these little, you know, connections and branches from this one little tree, you know, and the seedlings that it produced just from one article, um, that's definitely a high. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Nanette, how about you? What's, what's the highest high for you? Uh, let's see. Um... I guess I, I do enjoy uh, when I speak to one artist and other artists come up in the conversation that, that we mutually know, and then we start connecting the dots. Um, I, I had this idea and if somebody's really energetic out there, they should do this. I don't have the time right now. An artist family tree, because I'm literally, when I talk to somebody, I figure out how they're connected to what I've learned, who I've learned from, who my mentors were. Uh, one of the artists that I admire up here, um, Brian Tripp, I recently find out that we learned from the same master printer. I did not know that. 10 years apart, we learned from the same master printer. And so um, it's just little things like, um, like that and, um, um, let's see, so the, for, a, for a low, I would say the, the only thing that's really bothered me, um, uh, truly bothered me, and I couldn't figure out a way around it, was um, I had tried to interview uh, one particular um, uh, tribal entity uh, regarding a, um, a situation and um, they, because I was not a member of that tribe, um, they did not want to uh, have me interpret their culture in that way. And so uh, I, I do understand that. I, I would be skeptical if it was somebody I didn't know coming to me. Um, so I, I offered to write the article with them and make sure that everything they wanted into it uh, was was in the article, 
and it just was not, um, I, I think that this, this was a good, this was that learning moment, the takeaway, um, we will interpret our own culture is what I was told. And so, you know, um, as, uh, as, as frustrating as the conversations were back and forth, um, I, I think we left on a good note because I did understand it. They, they want to interpret their own culture and I think that's very reasonable. Um, yes. I think that's a good point. And um, so actually we have a very uh, practical question about paying artist fees. I wonder if you could talk a bit more, maybe Michelle um, or Melissa about the process for that. Like here in Canada, we use the CARFAC fees. But I'm curious actually, how does that work in the US with um, paying artists for their images and things like that? Um, so in my experience, um, the artist fees that those play in with curatorial projects. Um, and so that's been more of my direct experience with um, you know, compensating artists for their time and being as generous as the budget will allow. Um, that's also really important to me that um, you know, it's really nice you know, if a grant allows for artists to be paid more than what you might have been able to do um, originally. Um, and so, you know, that that's really important just in terms of those those collaborations and, um, you know, making sure there's equity um, in those those moments. Um, but maybe some of the other panelists could speak more about um, the image fees with artists or um, or other experiences. Oh, well, uh, I, most of the ones I've done, um, uh, you know, if, if it was over the phone, you know, there was an understanding that that's, you know, free publicity, as well as, you know, sharing with their community. Um, uh, you know, that's the reward um, for doing, you know, a magazine or a newspaper articles um, uh, or local newsletters. So um, uh, every once in a while, when I do maybe ask an artist to meet me somewhere, um, I know that they're going out of their way. So I'll, um, you know, give them like a gift card or something or, or something, you know, gas card money um, to get to that location. Because a lot of the people I interact with, you know, are in rural uh, settings. So, um, and I can't answer on the um, paying for imagery because uh, America handles all that for me. <laughs> I don't know. I've never had to. Um, it's it's been really difficult because you know it's um, a lot of these artists haven't been written about before. Mm. Um, they're not Googleable. They're they're not. Um, uh, we can't. Um, we, uh, I believe America did have to purchase at one point. Um, you know some uh, um, like from a, a permanent collection imagery. Um, uh, so that's the only thing I know about that. <laughs> Nanette, do you want to add to that or? Um, well, I've never uh, been in publishing. I don't work um, on that side of it. Um, I, my, my viewpoint on that is whomever I'm interviewing, um, it, I've looked at it as PR. I believe they've looked at it as PR. Um, I've never been um, asked to pay fees for images. Or asked to pay, or asked to um, inquire with my publisher about that. That's actually never come up in the conversation because it's, to my knowledge, been an understanding that um, this is, you know, very well known magazine or uh, whatever publication I'm working for, and um, this is public relations for them uh, on their behalf. Um, uh, I've just never had to, to deal with that, that question, actually. All right, so um, I think we're now going to officially move to the audience Q&A. So just a reminder to write your questions into the Q&A. And I have a more broad question. So what inspires you as an artist, a curator, and a writer? And I'm just curious to hear. I guess immediately made me think of and in market, you know, you're going to Santa Fe in August, you're surrounded by thousands of art artists and so much art. And, you know, I mean, it's um, how could it 
not be, you know, the purest form of inspiration, seeing all of these creative people in one spot. Um, and um, it, for me, uh, I do travel so far away. Um, I, uh, I, I just want to share that, you know, uh, with, with my community and I want to share my community with everybody else. So, I mean, um, and, and that's sort of my answer as an artist and a writer, you know. I, I really appreciate the, just being able to document the information and document the, um, the cultural knowledge and brought it up a little bit earlier, but um, I um, was not in, I have a BA in art, I have a BA in communications, I'm working on third degree. And in, in doing all this academic work, um, the, the things that I've needed have, have not been real readily available to me. I've had to go out and find it. Um, there's not enough um, peer reviewed articles. Mm -hmm. And um, so I look at a lot of what I do. Uh, the reason that I do it is um, for that next generation that needs this information before it's lost uh, to everything that's going on around us at the moment. Um, so that's, you know, that's my motivation or that's what, you know, that's, that's my happy place. You know, we're, we're gathering all this and we're saving it for the next generation. And for example, in my art history class, when I, when I got my first uh, art degree, um, uh, they uh, skipped over all that uh, Native American art because it didn't fit into the Western art history philosophy. So they just, uh, gardeners, that, that's what I'm trying to think, gardeners, we've all seen gardeners, right? Um, uh, they just skipped over that. And so um, um, I did not go to IAIA. <laughs> um, I regret that. Uh, so um, I would say the next generation. Yeah, and also how different each experience is in the writing process, um, you know, and speaking to, you know, prior to this past year, um, you know, there's been opportunities through First American Art Magazine where I've met a lot of other art writers, and I'm just so grateful, um, you know, that that's how that came about, where, you know, depending on what the project is, um, you know, but going to see an exhibition is what's coming to mind, and it's um, you know, when there's, uh, you know, press arrangements and, you know, when you're able to build relationships with writers in the field, uh, I think, I think that's a really important aspect. But when Melissa was talking, I was thinking about, um, yeah, you know, if you go to um, the market and, you know, you're seeing people around the corner and you're just like, hi, and, you know, reaching out that it's just, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for reunion um, throughout, um, you know, writing and particularly writing about Native arts. Um, so I'm grateful for all the experiences that um, offer that kind of reunion, you know, in, in all kinds of venues. Does anyone know off the top of their head if the um, Santa Fe Indian art market will be virtual this summer? Or has anyone heard anything about that? I asked them and they don't know. I mean, you hope, you certainly hope, but they, Swaya doesn't know. Okay, well, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, my Maybe next- says, Oh, sorry. Oh, you... go ahead, go ahead, America, go ahead. I was like, our schedule says we should go to open forum, but no, you have a question. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a comment from Devani Royalty. This is super interesting know, People are obsessed with this. Because like Melissa stated, the opportunity itself and to me is the reward. I've never asked to be paid when I do art projects or invited to art exhibits because the experience itself is priceless in my opinion. 